Hi everybody, it's uh, Dr. Moses Dixon here and we are filming another episode of Aging Well Together. And today I have the great pleasure of welcoming Secretary Ed Augustus. Thank you, uh, Doctor. To our show today to discuss a number of things, particularly um, the housing bond bill, the Secretary's vision for the Executive Office of uh, Housing and Livable Communities. And so, Mr. Secretary, I'll let you start. Give us a little bit about your background. You're very familiar to the folks here in Worcester and Central Mass, but uh, for a larger audience, uh, give us a little bit more about your background, and then we'll go into your vision for your role as, as secretary. Right. <clears throat> well, first, thank you for having me today. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, I was born and raised here in the city of Worcester and uh, spent almost 40 years now uh, in kind of politics, government, public policy. I was on the school committee in Worcester. Uh, I worked as uh, Congressman Jim McGovern's chief of staff uh, in D.C. for six years, <clears throat> worked in the Clinton administration at the Department of Education, uh, and had a chance to serve in the state Senate, representing this area for a couple of terms, uh, and then nine years as city manager of Worcester, um, which was a great opportunity to kind of really feel like I gave back to my hometown that I love so much and the and then Governor Healy asked me if I would come on, and she was creating this new role of a housing secretary. Uh, there hadn't been a housing secretary since the end of the Dukakis administration. Housing and economic development had been combined. <clears throat> and given the housing crisis and all the challenges uh, around housing, she wanted to create a standalone um, secretary and asked me if I would uh, serve in this role, which I've been doing for the last 15 months or so. And um, you know, very much enjoying it, but, uh, you know, certainly a lot of uh, issues from MBTA communities to emergency assistance shelter crisis uh, to trying to come up with some ideas uh, to move housing production forward, which is really what the Affordable Homes Act was all about. Yeah, and, and certainly I was excited when, when you were announced as the secretary because I've worked with you um, here in the city and uh, just your phenomenal record as city manager here uh, in Worcester. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your vision for for the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities? And then we'll go into the housing bond bill and what that means for everybody uh, in the state, but particularly for our seniors and our older adults. So I think uh, that my vision for housing is how do we create more housing f faster? Um, and I think about housing as kind of life cycle housing, the kind of housing that folks are looking for when maybe they're just getting out of college, maybe with a couple of roommates is different than the kind of housing folks are looking for when they get ready to start their family. Uh, and it's different than the housing they're looking for when they're empty nesters and they're looking to age in place. And so we as a state need to figure out how to make sure that we can create enough housing so folks can do all of that. Uh, life cycle here in Massachusetts. Right now, too many people, particularly in the 25 to 36 range, are leaving the state because they can't afford to find housing here. They can't afford to purchase a home, which many folks, you know, ha aspire to, know the benefits of home ownership and, and building equity that has intergenerational implications. And too often it's out of, out of reach for folks. So how do we create more opportunities for meeting the needs of people at every stage of their life for the appropriate type of housing? Uh, and, you know, looking at all the different levers that we can pull, pull uh, to impact that. Some of it is creating the first state housing plan uh, in 40 years, which we'll do at the end of this year, that'll have targeted housing production goals uh, for those different life cycles, different regions within the state. Some of it is increasing the subsidies, the tax credits, and the other tools that we use to incent housing. And lastly, it's how do we remove some of the barriers to housing production? That's implementing the MBTA Communities Act, uh, which Worcester uh, and many central mass communities are, are part of removing any zoning restrictions that might inhibit the production of housing uh, and delay the production of housing. Yeah, no, that's that's very uh, important, particularly um, 
being inclusive, uh, the MBTA communities. And when you were city manager, you worked with us to uh, designate the city of Worcester as an age-friendly mm -hmm. community. And so we are constantly hearing from a lot of older adults uh, in Worcester and Central Mass about the increase of housing uh, for rent um, and concerns about not having adequate housing for you know older adults to age in place. What does the housing bond bill do, particularly for our older adults who need more accessible and affordable housing? It's one thing to have affordable housing, but is it accessible for you know these folks to age in place? Yeah, no, it's exactly right. It's an issue. Uh, I was just before we came here today to tape this. I was speaking to uh, a Mahasa Mass Shelter Alliance, the biggest. Uh, part of our individual homeless population, biggest growing part of that are, are elders. Uh, and so we know the pressures uh, that many seniors who are often on fixed incomes face when either their apartment building uh, is bought by somebody else and they're going to jack up the rents because they feel like they can. Um, or, you know, they're not able to stay at home without some accommodations, whether it's you know, tub cuts or grab bars or, you know, things that allow them to age in place. And, and that's why the age friendly initiative is so important, because we want people to stay close to their caregivers, to their faith communities, to everything that, you know, makes a place home uh, for folks. Um, one of the things I think is, is important in the Affordable Homes Act is ADUs as of right. Uh, Worcester had done that. Uh, we have now created the ability for any single family homeowner in Massachusetts to have an ADU, to create an ADU. And we know disproportionately the folks who use ADUs are seniors. Uh, sometimes they're, you know, relatives, maybe a son or daughter uh, who creates an ADU, lets mom or dad uh, live there, kind of help uh, care give, uh, and creates an opportunity often for seniors who want to stay in their community. They're very you know, as I've talked to seniors, they're very committed because, again, that's their world, but there aren't appropriate places to go within that community. So by creating these ADUs, we think it's a way for maybe somebody who's overhoused. Uh, they've got a big house that they're struggling to take care of that a young growing family could use, and they could move into ADUs and create some movement in the housing space. For a lot of our lower income seniors, uh, we've got two billion dollars in this bill that's going to capital repairs to public housing. We know of the 43,000 state-owned units of public housing, uh, the vast majority of those are for seniors. And so we need to make sure that housing is in good condition and is accessible. Uh, and we're doing some major um, repositioning of public housing where we're tearing down old public housing, building back new, green, energy efficient, uh, and more fully accessible units yeah. uh, as part of this. Yeah, and that's that's important. Um, you know, in, in addition to the renovations of, or tearing down existing public housing to reimagine uh, them, it's also important that you know uh, affordable and accessible housing for for seniors also have sort of like a village mentality. And I know there's an organization in in Boston. Uh, is it Two Life? Yeah community that, that focuses on this type of model where you have not only where they can age in place, that they can be in a place where they're they're supportive. So could you talk a little bit more about creating spaces like that for, yeah. for seniors? Yeah, I've had a chance to visit several two life communities, uh, one in Brighton, uh, that they actually partner, it's, it's part of public housing. Uh, so they've embedded their service model uh, there. And some seniors who are in very low incomes, you know, maybe even significantly below 30% of area median income, still have all of the supportive services, whether it be help with health care. Um, often we know seniors who, especially if they don't have family close by, uh, as they age, they've got more doctors and more prescriptions and the coordination of that care and of the different medications is critically important or something going on day to day with them, that there's somebody outside who can notice uh, and pay attention. 
hey, so-and-so is acting a little differently or doesn't look quite right. And by having the kind of supportive services that folks like Two Life provide uh, and partner with other agencies to provide, uh, you see much better health outcomes. You see folks staying at home uh, much longer, uh, which is their goal and really should be the system's goal because it's more cost effective uh, and has better uh, health outcomes. So I really see Two Life and that model as something that is really the future uh, of senior uh, housing uh, to really be successful needing those kind of supportive wraparound services. Yeah. So the state of Massachusetts has acted with the housing bond bill to create more accessible and affordable housing production. What at the federal government level has um, the Biden-Harris administration done to sort of support um, the work that you're doing um, in, in your role? Well, HUD is a great partner with us. They're the primary federal housing agency, although some of the work that we do and some of the new things we're exploring also kind of goes over to the HHS side because, you know, a lot of the folks that we work with are on Medicare, uh, on, on Medicaid, and we've got a waiver from the feds that allows us to bill some of those uh, providers because, you know, people often talk about housing being a social determinant of health. We know if you're not properly housed, uh, it has a profound impact on your overall health. If you don't have proper heating or cooling, we know with climate change, the summers are hotter than they've ever been. Uh, if you don't have a unit that has air conditioning, that can impact your overall health. We know folks who, you know, if they don't have uh, healthy conditions, whether it be mold or pests or other things, that impacts their overall health. So, you know, looking for other ways, and, and the Biden-Harris administration have been very flexible and, and really get the idea that housing underlines uh, folks' health needs and allows for some of the more flexible use of funds that help us keep people housed with those supportive services and using some of those federal uh, programs to help pay for some of those costs. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's important. Um, uh, federal government being a partner is critical to the work um, uh, that you're doing uh, here. You know, we hear um, from some developers that are working with senior housing that the cost of inflation for materials and, and that sort of thing really can hamper um, the production of producing more housing. So how are you addressing that? I know the housing bond bill is, is yeah. meant to address that, but in your role um, as being the, the head of the organization, how are you ensuring that um, folks that start projects can uh, complete the projects in a, in a timely manner? Yeah. So I think there were two things that kind of hit the housing sector at the same time. One was the post-COVID inflation uh, we saw, and folks see it every day in their grocery bills, right, that eggs cost more and other kind of staples that folks, uh, you know, shop for every, every week cost more. Same thing happened in the building sector. So the cost of lumber, the cost of materials that go into the production of housing just cost more. That has stopped increasing, but the prices have not come down. So we're probably at a new... Yeah norm of higher costs for some of the building materials. And then that was coupled with the increase in um, interest rates. Um, and that was a response by the Federal Reserve to try to slow inflation. Uh, so projects that were in the process of being put together that, you know, often take 18, 24 months to put together to, you know, do the design, the permitting, put all the financing in place. When they started that was in the four and five interest four and five percent interest rate environment. Now it could be six, seven, eight percent interest rate, and deals don't pencil out anymore. They no longer financially work. The good news is we look like we're maybe on the cusp of the Fed kind of reversing things and starting to bring interest rates down, and that should be wind at our back yeah. uh, in terms of housing production. But we created in the Affordable Homes Act a new program called the Momentum Fund that is designed to put $50 million of state money into a fund that then would go out and raise additional dollars. Those dollars would come from retirement funds, 
from college endowments, from other foundation and uh, dollars that are often invested in real estate that could be invested in this momentum fund and then take an equity position in a deal and go in and say, we'll loan you money for 4% or 5% and beat the current capital costs in the marketplace to allow projects that were not feasible in this interest rate environment to kind of buy down those rates and get them back into production. So that's something that's in the bill that was created. Uh, that'll be <clears throat> in Mass Housing, which is one of the quasi agencies that we use to kind of do a lot of our uh, housing production. So I think that's one new tool uh, that should make a big difference. Yeah, and, and um, in addition to that mo momentum fund, um, Governor Healy created was a green bank. Uh, right. So how does that relate to housing production, the green, the green bank? So the green bank is also located in mass housing. We were the first state to stand up the green bank. And that was really to, designed to focus on affordable housing of all kinds for seniors and non-seniors. And to make sure that as we build this housing, um, that we do it in a sustainable way, uh, that we do it in a way that kind of shrinks the state's carbon footprint. Housing as a sector is the biggest emitter of carbon emissions. And if we only attack reducing carbon emissions through the new housing we, be, we build, and we don't deal with the existing housing, retrofitting that house, we're never going to reach our climate goals. So the Climate Bank is really designed to help provide financing and to also draw down some of the federal resources that are available. President Biden, Vice President Harris, who put in the Induc um, Inflation Reduction Act, historic levels of investments that allow for green technologies, whether it be solar, heat pumps, other things that help us kind of shrink our carbon footprint that have credits and rebates that help make more kind of attractive uh, using those technologies as we build housing. The Climate Bank helps fund some of the gap financing and other things necessary to move the projects forward while you go back and try to reclaim some of those credits and some of those rebates. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I think that's a phenomenal uh, plan given the climate crisis that we're, we're in. Um, you know, one final uh, question is, you know, Central Massachusetts, located in Worcester, but Central Mass is rural, pretty, pretty rural uh, communities. Um, as you're looking at housing production uh, for the state in general, but specifically Central Mass, where there's been a growing population in Worcester and in, in Central Mass, how do, is there any plan to, besides the MBTA uh, uh, housing plans to get more rural communities or uh, areas to consider uh, production of, of housing? Yeah. We are, so Governor Healy created the first ever rural um, affairs office. It's headed by former Senator Ann Gobi, who represented part of uh, the city of Worcester. Um, and that is working closely with Ann, we're putting together kind of a rural housing initiative. The challenges in many of our rural communities, I've had a chance to be out there and talking to them, there's a lot of infrastructure issues. They're often on septic systems. Uh, there's not uh, centralized sewer systems. Access to water, uh, is there the water infrastructure to bring to these or are you doing wells, <clears throat> which may work for single family homes, but if you're trying to do kind of more dense development, you know, apartment buildings or other things where often the scale makes more sense. It, it's a challenge accessing the kind of infrastructure necessary. So we're trying to look at through that rural lens, what are some of the unique challenges and some of the unique tools that we can put in our toolbox? Because often you have the land. Um, and, you know, I think given the changes in how people work, um, lots of people don't have to be in the office five days a week. They can be in the office one day a week or a couple of days a week. And so some of the communities that maybe folks didn't consider uh, as you know, workable for them to have long commutes, maybe if it's one day a week, two days a week, all of a sudden are opened up. So I think we do need to look at some of our you know, more rural communities 
but they've got some unique challenges that we're going to need to try to solve. Yeah, and just to follow up on, on that, so you've also been focusing on how do you transform former commercial office space um, into affordable housing. Could you talk a little bit about that initiative? Yeah. We did a, a bunch of it uh, in Worcester when I was city manager, the courthouse on Main Street. We took that. That was an office building. Uh, we turned it into 118 units of affordable uh, rental housing and saved a historic building. We did it with the central building on Main Street uh, that was empty for years. Uh, <clears throat> turned that into very um, affordable housing, down even the number of units below 30% AMI, saved a historic building. Uh, and it's often not only are we saving historic buildings, creating much needed housing, but we're putting density and putting people where we want people. Yeah in the downtown so that they're looking for a place to eat, they're looking for groceries, they're looking to support retail and businesses in that area. And there are commercial corridors or downtowns in almost every city and town in Massachusetts. So we've done it historically. If you think about how many places in Worcester and across the state had old mill buildings, and we turned many of those old mill buildings into housing. And again, it saved that historic character, created some cool housing. Uh, we think we can do that with office space. As people's kind of needs for office space change, how do we incent the conversion? We've got some new tax credits uh, that are for commercial to residential conversions, and we doubled the historic tax credits where if it's a historic building, there's now a lot more state-level uh, tax credit resources to help maintain the character and the history of that building, but also turn it into much-needed housing. Well, Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you for thank your you. time coming, it, coming, coming to speak with, with us today. And, um, you know, we really appreciate your partnership and look forward to working with you and your team uh, in the near future. And that wraps up our episode of Aging Well Together. And again, um, we thank all of you for tuning in and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.